Hello everybody, today I will start the module 9 uh, which is related to the steel processing and actually this module is very much uh, useful to understand the uh, steel making process. So, it is a very basic understanding uh, of the steel making process. So, that is why I kept this particular uh, module uh, which is very linked to material processing because we can see the steel industry what we can make the different kind of the steel that is more important to know uh, to understand the what way the steel industry actually works. So, uh, these topics related to this particular module is that first we will try to look into introduction to steel making processes, then we will try to discuss what are the ways to produce the single crystal structure, then little bit analysis of the uh, steel fluid flow analysis and we will try to look into some solidification. So, specific to the steel solidification and different uh, product processing technologies uh, to understand this uh, manufacturing of the uh, steel. Now, before looking into the steel, we some uh, need uh, some understanding on the where, how we can classify the steel or distinguish the steel as compared to the other kind of the materials. So, you know that metals and alloy can be usually two different ways. One is the ferrous materials where iron is the one of the component, the major component I can say that and non-ferrous where uh, iron is the may or may not be there. But even iron is there in non-ferrous that will be in the that composition will be the very minor percentage will be there. Now ferrous metals having two category one is the steels and steel as we can say the plain carbon steel and alloy steel and other category is the cast iron. So this basically iron uh, and steel. So, this is uh, related to basically iron making and steel making is we, we try to cover up uh, in this particular uh, module that is why. Now, from uh, cast iron also we have white cast iron, malleable cast iron and grey cast iron. So, these three different types of the cast iron we usually use in the, the so many applications and uh, specifically in the machinery construction we can use all this kind of the, the steel component. Therefore, we categorize the metal and uh, in the two basic categorization. Uh, one is the ferrous and next is the non-ferrous. So, non-ferrous also it may be the copper alloy, nickel alloy, aluminum alloy, titanium alloy and different kind of the super alloy has been developed and they are having the different purpose or different applications also and which may be different from the uh, ferrous materials. But our focus in the ferrous material and as well as the mainly focus on the steel because we are discussing the steel making processes. So, we mainly focus on the how to manufacture the different uh, steels that will be the main the discussion point in this particular module. Now, we see uh, there are several categories of the uh, steels also. One is we can say the plain carbon steel, it is a plain carbon steel as simple as that iron plus carbon, where the carbon is the um, this uh, iron is the main uh, element and uh, carbon is the this is the secondary element or minor element present in, within the steel. Of course, presence of this minor element can drastically change the property. So, therefore, properties can vary depending upon the presence of the carbon percentage. But in general, we can say that iron are plus iron the main constituent and plus carbon along with that more amount of the phosphorus, sulfur, uh, manganese and silicon uh, all ca can be uh, is a part of the uh, plain carbon steel. We can constitute the different gradient of the uh, different kind of the steel. Now, plain carbon steel it is having we can say the low carbon steel where carbon percentage is less than 0 0.3 percentage and this is having very specific application for the structure uh, usually ferrite and uh, uh, pearlite uh, in, in, in this particular uh, structure and low carbon steel is basically I can say the very close to the since carbon percentage is very very low we can say the composition very close to the, the wrought iron and this structure low carbon structure of the steel can be consist of the ferrite and the mixture of the ferrite and pearlite. Then medium carbon steel is the carbon percentage is 0 0.3 to 0 0.8 percentage of the carbon but here the we can say the if we see, see the microstructure of the medium carbon steel it is having the bionite structure or martensite texture or mixture of uh, combination of both. Even we go for the high carbon steel. In that case, if it is carbon percentage is more than 0 0.8 percentage carbon, then we can say the high carbon steel. So, it can it can high carbon steel is it can e easily form the 
the martensitic structure. So, uh, we can see that depending upon the structure whether ferrite, pearlite, martensite, bionite structure are there. So, in this case the properties can vary depending upon their uh, microstructure of the different kind of the steels. And we can see we can categorize the steel based on the carbon percentage in this, uh, this particular case. Now, overall you can say strength increases with increasing carbon content. So, we can say less carbon content means it is very close to the wrought iron. So, in, in that case strength is low, but if you increase the carbon percentage usually the strength is actually increases. So, I am talking about the in case of the plain carbon steel, but of course once the strength increases in general the ductility of the component is actually decreases. So, you can say the ductility and toughness uh, can decreases with increasing the carbon percentage. So, that is the general tendency or property we can see when you try to understand the different kind of the steels. Now, if you say the alloy steel also, in this case the alloy steel is the alloying elements are added in steel, the small quantity usually less than 5 percent to improve the strength or some other mechanical properties also or other kind of the properties. So, that is usually the small quantity, but when alloying elements is added is a very much quantity. For example, if it is more than 20 percent to produce the very specific properties and in that case we can uh, we can say uh, it's, it's a kind of the this uh, alloy alloy steel now the alloy can the there are so many alloying elements can be added at in alloy steel for example mn silicon copper chromium nickel molybdenum so many tungsten vanadium all the different alloying um, this composition alloying elements can add it uh, with the with the iron and that they, they brings the different varieties of the alloy steel so, each alloy steel they are having certain properties and composition of all also different and here you can see the large amount of the, the alloying elements is easily added, but all these cases it actually in this cases the this alloy steel the elements is added uh, is basically a very small quantity. Now, of course, there is a some property and uh, this alloying element there might be some uh, some relation means uh, might be there, but that is not the point of discussion here we are trying to get some overview of the steel. So, based on this uh, different alloying element the, there are different types of the steel. One is the high strength low alloy steel which is called HSLA steel. This steel we can find out the applications of the structural application in the construction of the bridge and building there we can find out the high strength low alloy steel. Even we have the micro alloy steel. Micro alloy steel in this cases this can be act as a substitute for the uh, heat treated steel. So, basically in certain uh, cases after the heat treatment we can achieve certain properties, but that that heat treated steel can be replaced by the directly you can use the micro alloy steel. So, that is why it can be the main this uh, important point related to the micro alloy steel that it can be replacement for the heat treated steel. Then margining steel it is a super high strength steel and very high toughness is also good. So, it is we can see the strength the combination of the high strength and the toughness is is basically achieved in case of the merging steel. Then stainless steel, the stainless steel is known mainly for the corrosion resistant properties. Similarly, tool steel also, the tool steel we can use in the in the uh, machining operations or any preparation of the die. So, definitely the tool steel must have very good wear resistance properties, should have combination of the very good toughness because able to absorb the energy, this vibratory energy kind of things will be there and at the same time it should be very high strength, should have very high strength. So, that is why tool steels can be used in the metal to making the this cutting tool in case of the machining operation. Similarly, silicon steel also there, uh, silicon steel in this case the, you can find out the application of the silicon uh, silicon steel that is the electric and magnetic application we can find out uh, this particular steel. So, here you can see there, there is a lots of varieties of the steel having their specific properties or this kind of the steels can be applicable on, on specific applications, but even the varieties of the steel much more what I have reported here. So, I am not going into that much details about the each and every type of the steel, but here these are the very well uh, known steels or we can see wide application of this particular steels in the different different area. So, these all are alloy steel. Now, if we talk about the cast iron, so that means uh, Basically, I am discussing cast iron uh, in, from the sense that what we can distinguish the iron, cast iron with uh, 
with the different kind of the steels. Usually you can see the steels is usually having the carbon percentage is less than 2 percentage, but in case of the uh, cast iron alloy is having more than 2 percentage of the carbon. So, that can be categorized as a cast iron. Of course, the main alloying element is the iron here, not alloying the main component of this cast iron is the iron. Along with that we can have the more than 2 percentage of the carbon. Sometimes along with this carbon molybdenum nickel can be added to improve the hardenability of the cast iron component. So, basically when uh, molybdenum and nickel are um, alloy, so they can produce the different kind of the phases and that phase may be bring some kind of the hardenability uh, within the structure. And of course, but overall the properties actually decided what can be the formation of the carbon in the different form. For example, the carbon can exist in the form of a graphite, carbon can exist in the form of a cementite also. So, what way the what phase the carbon present in a structure that actually decides most of the uh, properties and we can distinguish the different types of the carbon percentage just look into the what form the carbon presents within the uh, cast iron. For example, grey cast iron. In this grey cast iron carbon presence in the form of a graphite flex. We can see the carbon in the form of a graphite flex presence in the grey cast iron. So, because of that it is having very specific properties for example, ductility is relatively low, excellent compressive strength is there, good machinability is there, having very good wear resistance properties and at the same time also having very good sound and damping characteristics of the grey cast iron because all depends on the how carbon presence, the what form the carbon presence here. Similarly, but if you look into the white cast iron, here carbon presence in the form of a carbide. So, cemented carbide is actually very very hard and I, I say that uh, with respect to the ferrite phase, the cementite phase is very hard and ferrite phase is relatively soft. So, that is why in white cast iron since carbon present in the form of a carbide, it is actually is very hard as well as the ductility is very low. It means that it is very brittle material, but at the same time applied where abrasion resistance is actually required in this case because it is have it is actually very hard in this case hard and brittle. So, white cast iron. Now, if we look in the another type of the cast iron that is malleable cast iron. Here the malleable cast iron can be formed from the heat treatment of the white cast iron. So, from white cast iron we can form the this uh, malleable cast iron, but in this case the formation of the uh, in this cases, uh, the it creates the graphite uh, regular graphite phase, the carbon presence in the form of a graphite spheroids. So that is why it is pro these properties are different from the white cast iron. It is actually in this case the malleable cast iron, the cementite is actually the Fe3C cementite is decomposed, it uh, uh, dissociates and forms the uh, graphite spheroids. So that brings the greater ductility as compared to the uh, grey cast iron also. So, that is what this is the advantage of this thing. So, we see in this case the carbide graphite flex and here the regular graphite spheroid. The spheroid in the from a spherical shape graphite forms here and in this case the graphite flex are, are forms here and in this case white cast iron the graphite in, in this case the carbon in the form of a carbide. So, all these different formation of the carbon presence in the in the steels also they brings the, the variability in the uh, properties of the different types of the cast iron. Now, we we'll try to look into the focus on the steel and specifically there are steel making process. So, steel making process is basically the involving the selective oxidation impurities. So, of course, when you try to make the iron making, we are taking the time to the from the iron ore, we to extract the iron. In that cases, we basically try to remove the oxides there and to bring to prepare the this uh, iron, but it is this process the steel making is little the other way the, the reverse process. Here to control oxidation is basically introduced here just to improve the properties of the steel. So, here that is the that is in general is known as the steel making process, but modern steels we see already mentioned the modern steel there is a steel means there must be have some carbon percentage and along with the carbon there might be having some manganese Mn that actually improve the hardness and the toughness and low level of the sulfur and the phosphorus as impurities that can influence the properties like machinability and brittleness properties can be improved in presence of the sulfurous phosphorus, but quantity of the sulfurous phosphorus is very important. That has to be controlled way introduced in the 
modern steel. So, modern steel you can see that there are the carbon part, carbon is there along with the different kind of the elements we can add it to bring very specific properties and the at the same time it is very important what is the quantity is added uh, with the steel just to import the uh, just to bring the best properties of the steel. Now, here sulphur can be reduced also during the reducing process, but sulphur is also part of the this modern steel, but at the same time too much of sulphur presence in the steel also not uh, good for the to making a good quality steel. So, in that case sulphur can be reduced and through some reaction, reducing conditions through reactions occurring between the slag and the metal, between the slag and metal uh, the reaction occurs and we can reduce the quantity of the sulphur and of course and the small quantity we can control here in very specific to the steel making process. Now, once we make steel making process then but before that we need to know what can be the different types of the steel also to get understanding the there are varieties of the steel. But still most of the steels basically classified and some follow some code and that is basically associated with the American Iron and the Steel Institute which is called AISI. They have the different coding to interpret different types of the uh, steels also and it is consist of the uh, I think uh, there may be the digits four digit four digit first two digit is basically indicates that the major alloying elements and the last two digit basically indicates the carbon content. So, we can see also uh, uh, the in, in this case. Now, steel remains the backbone of the modern industrialization economics and of course, there is a lots of application of the steels and we can see engineering application of the steels almost everywhere, but main is the construction industry, automobile industry, machinery and infrastructure. These are the basic area where you can find out the huge application of the different types of the steel. Now, I coming back to this uh, different AISI code uh, of the steel. So, for example, the AISN number 1018, it actually indicates the plain carbon steel, but 1018 means the last two digit is basically indicates the carbon percentage. So, 18 divided by 100 that is basically 0 0.18 this is this indicates the carbon percentage and uh, 10 is basically associated with the plain carbon steel. Uh, this first uh, two digit uh, the this indicates the steel class. So, that is the and the major alloying elements in this case steel class and major element in indicates the first two digits. So, here, but apart from this thing we have uh, other components, but that is not exactly reflecting in the this AISI code, but the plain carbon steel it might be the uh, percentage of the MN 0 0.7 percent of a manganese sulphur percentage can be you can see the sulphur percentage can be go up to 0 0.05 percent is a very small quantity phosphorus can also 0 0.04 and there might be some other uh, elements also, but in plain steel the other elements are not there. Similarly, plain carbon steel if the grade is AISI number is 1095 that means 0 0.95 percentage of the carbon and 10 indicates that it is a plain carbon steel and there is the other elements also uh, present in, uh, in the steel. Similarly, if we say the alloy steel then you start is basically 5 1 it is a indicate the very specific grade of the alloy 5 1 and 6 0 6 0 is the 0 0.6 0 indicate the carbon percentage and there are other alloying element we can see this cases and in this case specifically in this alloy steel chromium percentage 0.8 percentage chromium is there. Now, overall you can see all this there are so many varieties of the steel we can see the right hand side I mentioned here ASI code you see 10 indicate the plain carbon steel, 1 on indicates the resulfurized carbon steel and similarly 1 5 indicates the high manganese carbon steel similarly for 5 1 chromium steel uh, is it is uh, it's like that. So, there are these different categories of this thing the first two digit is basically indicates that what are the different steel grade uh, in as per the EISI code and over we see that we are talking about the steel making also having very small percentage of the sulphur and phosphorus also you see all uh, the plain carbon and alloy steel maximum percentage of the sulphur and phosphorus is basically. 0 0.05 one case is sulphur and phosphorus can be 0 0.04. Actually this percentage of the carbon the sulphur and phosphorus is helpful to bring certain properties uh, of the steel, but if in this sulphur and phosphorus is much more then it creates some other problem uh, difficulties or quality of the steel. Now, we can see that steel basically consists of the iron is the main element iron and alloyed with the carbon 
already seen this thing and uh, containing the carbon percentages around 0.025 or 2 usually 2 percentage this is the wide range of the this carbon percentage is there and in, in case of the steel beyond 2 percent of the carbon is basically we can say this is the cast iron. Now classification of the steel we can see that plain carbon steel alloy steel already mentioned and plain carbon steel can be low carbon steel medium carbon steel and the high carbon steel and here you can see the carbon percentage are different in all these cases and alloy steel is the low alloy steel medium alloy steel and the high alloy steel. Here also we can see the carbon percentage is actually uh, is the uh, this uh, total sorry total alloy content are is less than 5 percent low alloy steel and medium alloy steel the alloy uh, alloying elements can be between 5 to 10 percent and the high alloy steel means that it is more than 10 percent of the uh, alloying elements are there associated to the alloy steel and we can see there is a wide graded different uh, variants of the uh, steel also. But here the other elements is usually added uh, to the steel just to impart or just to improve the different properties associated with the steel manufacturing. Now overall you can see what way the steel can be manufactured. So uh, steel can be manufactured we try to understand using this flow chart actually. We start with the first the raw material. So raw material start with the iron ore. So iron ore and the limestone we can use the sinter plant is basically use the the raw materials preparation before final processing of the steel making. So in the sinter plant we use the iron ore and the limestone uh, together uh, we take the output to the blast furnace but along with that there is a coke oven the coal also require you know the coal also required that can be the act as a source of the uh, carbon also. So it is a good quality carbon coke ovens are there from the coal is basically processed through the coke ovens and the compound is mixed with this thing uh, along with the iron and the output from the after the sinter plant what is the output from the iron and li limestone mixture here you can get the output is the mainly the this uh, iron and coke can mixed together which is put in the blast furnace and in the blast furnace is basically in this case the blast furnace uh, we can see the uh, the melt together all, all these components and then once the blast furnace operation is done and then we could we can put it in the the scrap material can also add it here because steel scrap can also add it so along when you make making the steel component so steel scrap added along with the uh, this uh, the blast furnace component together and then we can put in the this because the blast furnace is basically mainly focused on the iron making. So blast furnace is basically try to focus almost pure iron and because in this case we try to reduce the oxides and other elements in this case the in blast furnace. So one take the output from the blast furnace and uh, mix up with the, the along with the scrap material mix up then put it in the the basic oxygen furnace BOF here we try to uh, produce the uh, steel making process basic oxygen uh, furnace because in this case maybe we can add the other alloying elements in the control way and uh, we can see that uh, um, even for the uh, this scrap material can also be the uh, electric arc steel making process we can use the electric arc furnace also. Uh, electric arc furnace also you can utilize and the, the using the scrap material but both either you can basic oxygen furnace or we can process the electric arc furnace EAF we will discuss the later on the what are the different types of the furnaces and both the cases we can we can produce the steel using this thing stool once the steels are there with the control addition of the different elements then we put in the ladle. So in the from the ladle we put here to perform the continuous casting process. This is the usual process to manufacture the steel. Continuous casting process we put the liquid metal here and then liquid metal can be cooled over a copper mold. So one particular length copper mold and most of the case we use the water cooled copper mold such the liquid uh, steel uh, can be converted to the solid steel here uh, using the continuous casting operation. So here continuous casting operation the liquid metal is poured here and the, with the turn disc and the here liquid metal a reservoir of the liquid metal and from there control we can put it and we can get the output with the 
steel strand. Now, steel strand means basically solidified steel, we can get it uh, here. Now, this solidified steel is the semi finished product, we can put, we can convert it the, this uh, solidified steel in the different geometric format. One we can convert in the in the form of a blooms, in the form of a blade, in the form of a slab. We can we can put it, uh, that is the output from the continuous casting process. Now, we can do further operation also, we can do hot rolling mills also, we already explained that from hot rolling mill, the steel one of the, this thing would make the, reduce the thickness of the uh, steel also and uh, try to get the different shape. So, here hot rolling operation reduce the thickness of the blooms or the billets and then final product can be in the different shape which is basically we can get it in the market available. This is the final product in the form of a pipe, the different geometric say, rectangular solid, rectangular hollow component, the T section, L section, channels, different type of the sections we can get. This is the final product, but before that we get this thing after the semi finished product from the continuous casting process, we perform the hot rolling operation and then we convert it to the final product, it is the final product. So, these are the basic structure of the the steel making process we usually uh, follow uh, which uh, uh, in the market. Now, I will try to discuss about the different uh, steel making furnace basically, we will try to the operation. So, uh, Bismarck process is the very old process, the first step of the when started the steel making process commercially. So, here Bismarck process is I think uh, it was uh, is a long uh, went, uh, and I think uh, around 1879 at that time this process started with this thing. In this case, the Bismar process is started with the cylindrical converter, we can use the cylindrical converter which is lined with the refractories, with the silica refractories because that will be able to the sustain the liquid, uh, able to liquid metal. So, that is why refractories is very hard. So, silicon refractories, equalizing refractories wall, we can create over a cylindrical element and that actually hold the liquid uh, steel. So, here the refract is used and that can try to produce the uh, this thing the steel also in the which is which was very low cost. Uh, in this case we can see the air is passed blowing air uh, that actually helps to exothermic oxidation reaction and that raise the temperature of this uh, system very high about that will be able to uh, basically reach the melting point of the, the steel. Now, Bismarck steel production actually it was very rapid and it refining taking only about 20 minutes. So, that means it takes very less time and that is why it was very uh, ideal for mass production at that time, but it is having the limitation. It is not able to remove the sulphur and the phosphorus because we see the sulphur and phosphorus requirement is very, very low and that has to be controlled in case of the steel making process. So, that is the main limitation. So, inability to control the proper percentage of the sulphur and phosphorus is the basic uh, disadvantage of this process and that actually can lead to the hot shortness kind of the defect during the steel production system. Now, this process has been improved further looking into investigate all this process, this further improved the with the intervention of the uh, Thomas process in 1879, which is actually used the basic oxides to remove the phosphorus from the steel. So, use the basic oxides to remove the phosphorus steels, but in this case, this steel also support the high nitrogen content. So, but when you try to remove, utilize oxides to remove the, uh, to make the reactive with the phosphorus and to remove the phosphorus, but at the same time, it actually introduce high amount of the nitrogen content. So, therefore, that is why, which is actually decline in importance with the advancements of the open hearth process. So, that actually, this applicability of this particular uh, um, process is basically gradually declined and they, because there is a new another process has been developed that is called the open hearth process. So, up to 1950 Bismarck converter is basically by 1950. So, at that time it was closed that means this we do not uh, people do not longer use this thing this particular process to produce the steel by 1950 and they search for the alternate process also because there are some some difficulties was there also may, mainly the uh, process is the remove the phosphorus that was the main difficulty. But 1950 Bismarck converter is completely closed and but of course, but this process is important because it started with the commercially producing the steel uh, at that time and at that time it is basically bulk, it was the only option for producing the bulk steel production. 
Later on, the open hearth process comes into the uh, explore, and in this case, the main he tried to overcome the limitation by the Bessemer process that was the high nitrogen content is reduced in the open hearth process, it produced the low nitrogen steel and it is more better control the composition of the steel as possible using the open hearth process. So, open hearth process is basically shallow rectangular refractory line tray with roof, roofs are there because that roofs are there for allowing the efficient heat production is basically associated with the main features of the this open hearth process. But in this case, this along with the steel that means from the iron making the from the iron to convert it to the steel, the steel crafts also utilize. So, here the charge means which is about to melt comprising of the steel scrap, hot metal, lime and the iron ore all can be introduced together. Uh, through the door in front of the wall and of course, because the front door it is easy to visualize this thing the inspection sampling task was good in this particular case. So, but in, in this case this heat was generated in such a way the liquid fuel and flame temperature can go up to 1600 degree centigrade. So, that is the uh, in case of the open hearth process. So, that is sufficient to produce the uh, steel using this particular process. Oxygen for oxidation of the elements like silicon, carbon, manganese, phosphorus can be controlled through the oxidization process and that actually supplied by both the iron ore and the atmospheric oxygen that actually try to reduce this element by reacting with this thing. So, that is why open heart furnace could produce the different types of the steel for example, uh, in different grades of the steel by controlling the different composition of the other alloying elements in case of the steel that was the main advantage as compared to the other process. But the limitation is that this process actually was very slow. It needs usually 6 to 8 hours minimum for the each heat. So, that is the main obstacle associated with this open hearth process. But of course, it replacement by oxygen steel making in late 1950s uh, by introducing the oxygen the steel making process the late 1950s it was very important. The open hearth process made significant contribution uh, at that time for the steel making technology. Now, further after that there is the electric furnace steel making is basically uh, introduced and in this case the similar features for the open hearth furnaces, but in this cases the controlling of the heat are different. In this case we use the, the electric arcing to produce the, the fuel, um, electric arcing is used in this case uh, instead of the, the fuel combustion. So, that is the main features which is different from the open hearth process. So, here this electric furnace steel making EAF uh, with electric arc furnace is basically better precise control and the ability to produce the tailor made steel is possible. So, I mean to say that it is better control the heat uh, production is possible and control the uh, this thing the this composition of the steel also better control uh, is possible as compared to the open hearth process. So, that is why it is possible is using this process the high quality steel is possible to produce. Special and alloy steel is different type of the very specific steel and alloy steel is predominantly produced using the electric arc furnaces and of course, it having the uh, way to control the very specific requirements is there then this electric arc furnace is more flexible to produce the very specific type of the steel. Now, coreless induction furnace of course, here this is the one option we can see the electrodes are there and from the figure electrodes are there we can see the between the molten steel uh, there is a the arc arcing is created and this arcing is basically produce the uh, supply the heat and that is heat is basically able to melt this uh, metal and the slag which is usually in the lighter in weight that come on the uh, top surfaces and the latter one can remove the, the uh, slag also or you can collect the, the molten steel also by keeping slag on the top. Now, here the coreless induction furnace is basically another alternative for producing the high quality and special type of the steel or uh, as well as the alloy steel also. In this case, the we can use the instead of the arcing and all this thing can directly use the induction furnace. So, that actually induction furnace is basically brings in the small trials heat for the experimental purposes initially and after that uh, widely used uh, this thing uh, initially status to the laboratory and after that widely used using the the induction heating based 
uh, furnace because in this case from few kilogram to 20 to 25 tons the steel can be produced uh, using the electric uh, this induction furnaces. So, that is why it is more versatile as compared to the electric arc furnace. So, that is why uh, after after this thing the this induction heating uh, based uh, furnace is basically makes the more popular and in recent years uh, this induction furnace have popularity in India for producing the small ingots which are then processed into the small shape by the re-rolling of the mill. So, basically this induction in the now in India this induction furnace is very popular it's producing the uh, very spencil ingots very small volume ingots is possible to produce. Actually induction uh, best furnace the, we have the better control on the heating even large volume as well as the small volume is depending upon the size of the coil is the main factors to use the induction furnace for the steel making process. Apart from this thing induction for the steel making process then uh, recent development are is related to the basic oxygen steel making which is called the BOS. Basic oxygen steel making is basically use the pure oxygen to oxidize the impurities in the molten iron. So, first oxidizing the impurities make the impurity oxides and the resulting in the uh, that actually oxides form and that usually lighter in weight and that it can be uh, create the slag formation and then it produce the very high quality of the steel is possible to produce using the basic oxygen steel making process. So, highly efficient rapid production large quantity steel all can be uh, produced using this type of the uh, process at the same time the energy consumption also low as compared to the other uh, uh, steel making furnaces. So, but how it works in this case we can see that this process involves the injecting pure oxygen you can see uh, injecting the pure oxygen is there into the chamber in the molten iron bath and we can see and then which reacts with the impurities like for example oxygen react with the carbon silicon and the manganese and that actually produce the slag that can be easily the slag can be easily because slag is easily separated from the molten uh, steel because the weight of the slag is very low. Now, once it is done then we can collect the uh, collect the slag after certain level uh, slag is there then we can remove the slag also. And you see the molten iron is basically around 70 to 75 percent and the steel crafts also 25 to 30 percent along with the uh, lime or uh, dolomite is mixed uh, here together and refractory lining is there because refractory lining is anyway required to sustain at the high temperature this thing tap hole. So, one sided we can collect the steel also one sided and other sided we can collect the, the slag also and in this case uh, we can use uh, this uh, basic uh, oxygen furnace the principle of the oxygen is used mainly for the to formation of the oxides. It can is the versatile and can accommodate various types of the iron feedstocks uh, for example, this iron feed different types of the iron feedstock can be utilized including the hot metal from the blast furnace. So, directly we can use the from the uh, blast furnace we can produce the almost iron that can be directly used also here in this particular furnace and directly direct reduced iron can be uh, used in this particular uh, furnace. Steel making process globally efficient flexibility and ability to produce the high quality steel also and very specific type of the steel for a wide range of the application. So, that is why this is having the more applicability the basic oxygen steel making process is uh, usually uh, used. Now, once we understand the different types of the, the steel making processes, now we will try to focus on the uh, different types of the single crystal production system. The single crystal production, single crystal means the uh, it is very important the single um, crystal because it is basically produce the uniform in the continuous crystal structure throughout the entire material. So, certain cases single crystal structure is important in the in semiconductor industry and here uh, single crystal is easily produced in this case there might not be any kind of the grain boundaries are there and of course uh, almost defect free uh, component can be, uh, can be produced. So, single crystal uh, there might not be any kind of the polycrystals in, in case of the single crystal structure that is why in conventional polycrystal material there are multiple grains or multiple crystals are there and they can orient it in the different direction but in case of the single crystal structure it is only composed of the single and uninterrupted crystal lattice 
any kind of the material defects might not be uh, there associated with the single crystal structure. But in the other way, if there is no grain boundaries, it means that there is no surface defects also. It means that there is a decrease in the yield strength. So, that means single crystal structure is the yield strength is lower and as compared to the polycrystal in structure. But more importantly, decrease the amount of the script. The more advantage you are getting the single crystal structure is that we can decrease the amount of the creep. So, because creep is one kind of the properties find out the application of a material at the high temperature application. So, creep property is very important. So, in the high temperature application, the we can reduce the creep. So, that is why there is utilization of the single crystal structure. Now, single crystal materials, we can find out the application in the high performance industry such as aerospace, power generation and automotive, automotive engineering, all these areas, we can find out the application of the single crystal structure. Because we see the in case of the turbine blade, because turbine blade is exposed to the relatively high temperature and there is a centrifugal force also acting uh, when you use the turbine blade. So, in that case, single crystal structure is more appropriate because creep is less in the single crystal structure. Similarly, engine components, structural elements in advanced machinery, we can find out the application of the single crystal structure. But overall, there are so many techniques to produce the single crystal structure. One is the Chojores Clicks process, Bridgman technique, Bernoulli method, zone melting, Kuiperplus technique and vapor growth. These are the different techniques we can use uh, for produce the single crystal structure. And here pooling technique is that uh, this method is basically name of this method is against the scientist who developed uh, this pooling technique in 1916 uh, in the, that year. So, this process is basically works is the method for the large scale single crystal structure if you produce this particular method is used and this is applicable in case of the semiconductor metals and the gemstone to produce the gemstones also we can use the single crystal structure that means almost defect free uh, structure. So, process involves melting and maintaining the charge slightly above the melting point of course, just above the melting point uh, we need to melt the material particular material and then we use the see there is a pulling rod is attached with this thing and there is a sheet metal, sheet metal is there and the sheet crystal is there. So, sheet crystal is basically introduce the single crystal structure, the starting of the single crystal structure. So, if you look into this figure, there is an inductor, I mean induction heating is there and this is a container, the melt liquid metal is there, this is liquid metal and we have the sheet metal also single structure and the mechanism for the pulling as well as the rotation of this particular bar. Now, when the seed is contact with the liquid metal and we are gradually allowing to cooling, but cooling should be controlled on one direction, particular direction such that that direction the if we convert it, if we this uh, modulate the cooling one particular direction. So, in that case the solidification will occur in this, this direction and then gradually the crystal structure, the crystallization will be possible. So, the starting with the seeding uh, seed crystal, so here and contact with the liquid metal and this is in the, this if you see this is the total environment is the, this heating is there. So, one one sided heating is there, continuous supply of the heating is there, then basically we are not allowing to bring any kind of the temperature difference along that direction. So, rather if you put in the one, this direction the, there is a suddenly hot medium to the cooling medium. So, gradually the liquid is crystallization and we are pulling this particular rod which in contact of the uh, seed uh, crystal, the crystallization occurs and gradually pulling it and to bring the uniform, ensure the uniformity, we also rotate uh, this particular pulling rod. Now, here this crystal growth is controlled um, in this particular case and here we see the the pooling rate is basically influenced by the thermal conductivity, latent heat of fusion and the pooling rod cooling rate. So, what are the cooling rate we are following? Uh, based on that, this pooling rate can be uh, there. So, that means the gradually we pull gradually and then keep on the crystallization occurs. So, this is the this pooling technique method and it is the earlier method, but here you can see the advantage and disadvantage of the uh, this uh, Chojoreski method. Here, we see that this is the mainly used for the semiconductor industry for growing the large single crystal structure. But in this case, absence of the direct contact between the wall, crucible wall, you see the, in the container wall 
and the crystal uh, that actually we there is a absence of the direct content so that actually try to reduce the stress and the yielding unstressed single crystal uh, basically try to produce the unstressed single crystal using this uh, this particular technique but this particular technique is not uh, suitable if there is a some irregular range of the melting temperature or maybe which is there is a, the very high values of the melting point temperature or there is a conflicting values of the melting in a particular compound in that case this particular technique is not suitable but this process already started this uh, started with the seed crystal so it depends on the seed crystal of the same composition so seed crystal and the metal of the same composition that actually brings the limitation in use uh, in this particular uh, process so here you see that how it works uh, this uh, this pooling method uh, see the uh, liquid metal is there and then we contact with the seed and see continuously solidification occurs so rate of the solidification occurs and gradually pulling it out and and then this is this way it can produce the single crystals but on this uh, this cases it is very important what we are controlling this uh, the structure now the separate part is there and we can we can remove the top layer and then uh, this uh, uh, after that we can uh, here is just showing the diamond uh, single crystal structure now we can make it the different components also as per the requirement and we can even we can create the very thin chip also uh, if the requirement the very thin the sheet can be created from the single crystal structure now there is a another way bridgeman method this technique is named after the this particular uh, scientist in the year 1925 so here the method for the growing crystal ingots and bowls the, it started with the heating the polycrystalline material we started heating the polycrystalline material creating the melt of course above the melting point and slowly uh, cooling it from one end so here we can see that uh, this is the this heat this coil is there so basically we perform the melting and quartz crucible is there because quartz the melting point temperature is very high so it will be able to sustain that the to able to contain the molten material here and on other side we can perform the cooling action so cooling action here you can see the cooling action gradually look it if the this side is very hot here you can the cold temperature so cooling is basically directed in one direction and then gradually the solidification occurs and gradually pull it down so in this also the similar methodology it works the single crystal material forms progressively along the length of the container so this is the length of the container but process can be applicable for horizontal and the vertical geometry both way this process can be applicable but we can say the advantage is that technically it's a very simple method but cost is also very low but in this case the the selecting the appropriate container can produce the crystal of the pre-assigned diameter so the appropriate container design of the container is the most important in this in this particular case but disadvantage is the the compression of the solid because in this case the compression might happen at this at the interface with this thing when it, there is a formation of the uh, this liquid so compression of the solid by the contracting container so that can create some kind of the the development of the stress and uh, because that actually brings some high enough to nucleate the dislocation of the material so that uh, the stress can create the bring some kind of the dislocation formation dislocation is a line defect associated with this thing so when there is a loss of dislocation that means it is not exactly the uh, single crystal structure because dislocation is basically try to distinguish is make it the influence of the solidification behavior if the dislocation density is too high then it creates the separate grains also so then it becomes polycrystalline material so that's why try to prevent the formation of the dislocation here and here the stress the compression of the solid might create some kind of the stress also and that try to bring the dislocation so that is the main difficulties associated with this Bridgman method now single crystal production can be done also uh, Bernoulli method in this case it actually depends on the the started with the is a fine powder pure fine powder that actually first produced through an oxygen hydrogen flame so in this case uh, the falling into the fused end so here you can see the seed crystal but seed crystal temperature is relatively high because it is under the muffled furnace so we pass the this thing with the, some screening is there pass the powder 
uh, through here and then with the supply of the hydrogen uh, and the oxygen they are actually uh, the spare powder source and the uh, in, in this case this, this create the flame and that flame actually try to melt the powder and this it is attached with the, the seed crystal and that will bring gradually the single crystal structure using this thing the mechanism lifting apertures on all this the mechanism is there we can control the distance uh, between the seed crystal and the, uh, the flame also. But flame is basically supplied with the, the powder material here. So from the powder uh, we can convert to the uh, we can bring the single crystal structure here. So here powder charge is fed from the powder source using the special tapping mechanism we can see there is a special tapping mechanism just to controlling the powder from here. Now crystallization is process prescribe uh, apertures is used achieved by the uh, coordinating the consumption of the charge of course hydrogen and oxygen and of course with the rate of the descent of this so all the process is controlled by the uh, in this case the apertures is used just to controlling the inlet of the oxygen hydrogen as well as the powder material so that can be controlled and once it is controlled then the rate of the descent of the seed that can also be controlled using this particular method so here advantage we can see that there is no container so basically no container means the interaction of the uh, container wall in this case so that is avoided using this particular process and that's why problem of the physical chemical interaction between the melt and the container materials can be avoided using this particular process so that's why this is the one check um, one features in this process so technically very simple the growth of the crystal can also be observed uh, here and the single crystal of the usually the ruby sapphire can be grown using this particular technique and uh, single crystal in various shape like plate shape, disc shape can be controlled, hemisphere, cones. So different different geometric shape can also be controlled, uh, produced using this particular uh, process. Uh, so here is the, because this particular process different geometric shape is possible to produce because it is not exactly having the interaction with the, the wall of the container in this particular process. Next, we can discuss the single crystal production using the zone melting method. So zone melting method is we know the zone melting method one of the most uh, solidification techniques just to purification of the material but similar kind of the technology is also applicable to produce the single crystal uh, structure production. Zone melting that actually involves the creating the liquid zone the very localized position if we create the liquid zone and gradually move this liquid zone one particular directions. So in this case the purification of the material also occurs at the same time this promotes the formation of the single crystal structure also. So it works like that uh, liquid zone melting at the small amount of the material within the relatively large or the long solid charge. So relatively large and the long solid charge we can see uh, here the uh, uh, this is the uh, material here and we see very focused the small area we can focus the uh, this halogen that very focused you can put the heating also here. So that part is basically melting and that melting molten zone uh, is a basically this for example here you can see this is the heated area. Now this heated area now gradually this heating area is basically move as per the solidification front move the synchronizing with this solidification front speed we can move gradually. So then continuously there is a uh, one molten zone. Uh, will be there and that gradually solidification occurs and it can follow one particular direction. So here the zone melting is basically using that they actually try to remove the impurities uh, in the con uh, in the concentrated in the molten portion of the sa sample that will try to uh, the, uh, the collect the impurities one, one particular um, direction or one particular zone. So that particular zone which zone is melting that part these impurities are collected there and that is gradually moved means continuously scanning the impurities and collecting the impurities just by moving the molten zone. So this process sweeps them out throughout the sample and concentrates them at the end of the crystal bowls so that we can see which is then cut off and basically discarded from this thing. So this method is sometimes used the purification of the semiconductor crystal also uh, this method can be utilized. So that is a very uh, advantage of the zone melting process. There is another process that is called the uh, uh, Cairo uh, Polas technique in this case also use the single crystal production in this case the cooled seed is dipped 
into the melt. So, seed petal, uh, we can use this is the seed that actually dipped into the molten uh, uh, melt within the crucible to initiate the single crystal growth. So, that is when it is the seed is contacted with the molten metal that part the solidification starts and it is contacted a through this seed and the through this rod and then because the we promote the heat conduction on particular direction then gradually crystallization occurs along with the seeds the uh, that uh, that attach with the seed seed of the single crystal so here heat removal is controlled by adjusting the furnace temperature so by adjusting the furnace temperature the heat removal is is basically controlled in this case because we see the crystal is there formation melt the heat sealed also there in this case the heat seal you can put it, you can put the insulator, there is a support also and this is the heater. So, heater is the control heat and this is also heater and this is a complete chamber is there and this starting with the seed here and we can see this is the uh, closed here and this through heat contact and there so that uh, as per the movement of the seed the solidification can be controlled one particular direction. So, crystal growth progresses as the melt cools and with the seed serving as the nucleus basically. So, when seed is contact with the molten metal, they act as the nucleus and seed up for the nucleus and so nucleus and starts from there and then it is gradually grow one particular direction. So, here some crucible rotation also because at the same time it is a moving uh, and sometimes crucible can also be uh, rotated also to bring the uniform cooling and the bring out the uniformity in the crystal growth throughout this process. So, this is the technique. But advantage is the in this case the crystal growth grown in a larger diameter is possible using this particular method. But the when the large diameter crystal can be produced using this process, we can make also prism, lens, and the other optical components. So from the large diameter crystal, so different small small uh, components can be cut out, and we can use it in the different lenses and the other manufacturing of the other components. So here you can see this is the single crystal product do we have tried to explain the different uh, okay single crystal uh, structure now there is another single crystal production system that is called the vapor growth so here we are not using the liquid the molten metal or not required but directly from the vapor phase through the condensation of the vapor we can produce the single crystal structure also so the vapor growth is basically widely used for the bulk crystal epitaxial film very thin film we want to produce uh, in that cases the vapor growth is the most important technique and if you try to produce a very thin coating also for the single crystal structure then vapor growth is the mechanism for that or process for producing this kind of the film of the thin coating. It is basically divided into the main component one is the chemical transfer method another is the physical transfer method. So, both are the vapor growth method in case of the chemical transfer method in this case transfer of the material as a chemical compound. So, transfer of the material in the from the halide, the transfer of the material. In this case, the material is actually decomposed into, into the growth area uh, and, and make some reaction and that actually depending upon the this growth area that means what way material can be decomposed, it depends on the, the type of the reaction uh, we can observe. But it start with the chemical involvement of this thing, we usually start with the halides. Now, growth region part can be hotter or can be cooler as compared to the source and depending upon the reaction involved what type of the reaction involved it can be the growth part region it can be hot, hotter or it can be cool, uh, cooler. So, both uh, possibilities are there in the uh, at the growth zone when you try to perform the chemical uh, transport method. But physical transport method in this case is the directly transport of the material by the evaporation or sublimation on the hot surface zone to the Cool, from a hot surface zone to the cool zone, cool region. So, basically directly transport of the, the material through the evaporation because if you transport the metal through the evaporation to a cooler zone, then this cooler zone the material will be deposited. And in this case, for example, the this uh, zinc sulphide, cadmium sulphide in, in this case, uh, this type of materials we can find out the applicably the physical transfer method uh, for the single crystal production. Growth can occur in vacuum or growth can occur with a moving gas stream also both kind because some kind of the uh, this uh, growth during the growth we can protect this thing though so that is why growth can occur in the vacuum also. Suitable for using the seed crystal 
basically to produce the seed crystal uh, uh, in, in this case and which can be material being grown or another substances. So, the this process methodology can be used either to produce the seed crystal and it facilitate to because we see all other uh, vapor uh, or single crystal production we have used we started with the, the seed crystal. So, this method can be utilized to produce the seed crystal and then it facilitate to follow the other kind of the single crystal production system. Advantage of, of the vapor growth process is that the films mainly the films and the thin structure can be produced but the films can be obtained by the closed space transfer method and decomposition of the compounds. The film can be produced the decomposition of the compounds and which you can we can see in chemical transfer method. For example, crystal of the silicon, diamond, gas, semiconductor compounds can be grown by this method, uh, not gas, I think silicon, diamond and semiconductor compound uh, can be grown uh, by this particular method. So, uh, we can see that using this vapor growth technique, we can produce the diamond crystal or maybe very thin film of the diamond or very thin film of the sem uh, semiconductor or very thin film of the silicon can be produced using this uh, vapor growth method. So, here I have tried to explain the different steel making uh, processes that we just tried to explain the different furnaces from where we can produce the steel and this is the very basic uh, methodology I have tried to explain here. Apart from this thing we have uh, explained the around 5 or 6 uh, this uh, single methods for producing the single uh, crystal uh, structure. So, that is all. Thank you very much for your kind attention.